relation the eternal objects, relational between object and subject, express the formal constitution of the objectified actual entity. In presentational objectification, the relational eternal objects fall into two sets, one set contributed by the extensive perspective of the perceived from the position of the perceiver, and the other set by the antecedent concrescent phases of the perceiver. What is ordinarily termed perception is consciousness of presentational objectification. But according to the philosophy of organism there can be consciousness of both types of objectification. There can be such consciousness of both 92 types because, according to this philosophy, the knowable is the complete nature of the knower, at least such phases of it as are antecedent to that operation of knowing. Locke misses one essential doctrine, namely, that the doctrine of internal fact and form. 59 relations makes it impossible to attribute change to any actual entity. Every actual entity is what it is, and is with its definite status in the universe, determined by its internal relations to other actual entities. Change is the description of the adventures of eternal objects in the evolving universe of actual things. The doctrine of internal relations introduces another consideration which cannot be overlooked without error. Locke considers the real essence and the nominal essence of things. But on the theory of the general relativity of actual things between each other, and of the internality of these relations, there are two distinct notions hidden under the term, real essence, both of importance. Locke writes 3, 3, 15 essence may be taken for the being of anything, whereby it is what it is. And thus the real internal, but generally in substances unknown, constitution of things, whereon their discoverable qualities depend, may be called their essence. It is true, there is ordinarily supposed a real constitution of the sorts of things, and it is past doubt there must be some real constitution, on which any collection of simple ideas coexisting must depend. But it being evident that things are ranked under names into sorts or species only as they agree to certain abstract ideas to which we have annexed the set name, the essence of each genus or sort comes to be nothing but that abstract idea, which the general or sort of, if I may have leave so to call it from sort, as I do, general, from genus name stands for. And this we shall find to be that which the word, essence, imparts in its most familiar use. These two sorts of essences, I suppose, may not unfitly be termed, the one the real, the other the nominal, essence. 93. The fundamental notion of the philosophy of organism is expressed in Locke's phrase, it is past doubt there must be some real constitution, on which any collection of simple ideas coexisting must depend. Locke makes it plain p. 2, 2, 1 that by a simple idea, he means the ingression in the actual entity illustrated by a piece of wax, a piece of ice, a rose, of some abstract quality which is not complex, illustrated by softness, warmth, whiteness. For Locke such simple ideas, coexisting in an actual entity, require a real constitution for that entity. Now in the philosophy of organism, passing beyond Locke's explicit statement, 
The notion of a real constitution is taken to mean that the eternal objects function by introducing the multiplicity of actual entities as constitutive of the actual entity in question. Thus the constitution is real because it assigns its status in the real world to the actual entity. In other words the actual entity, in virtue of being what it is, is also where it is. It is somewhere because it is some actual thing with its correlated actual world. This is the direct denial of the Cartesian doctrine, an existent thing which requires nothing but itself in order to exist. It is also inconsistent with Aristotle's phrase, neither asserted of a subject nor present in a subject. I am certainly not maintaining that Locke grasped explicitly the impli. 60. Discussions and Applications Cations of his words is thus developed for the philosophy of organism. But it is a short step from a careless phrase to a flash of insight, nor is it unbelievable that Locke saw further into metaphysical problems than some of his followers. But abandoning the question of what Locke had in his own mind, he, organic doctrine, demands a real essence, in the sense of a complete analysis of the relations, and interrelations of the actual entities which are formative of the actual entity in question, and an abstract essence, in which the specified actual entities are replaced by the notions of unspecified entities in such a combination, this is the notion of an unspecified actual entity. Thus the real 94 essence involves real objectifications of specified actual entities, the abstract essence is a complex eternal object. There is nothing self-contradictory in the thought of many actual entities with the same abstract essence, but there can only be one actual entity with the same real essence. For the real essence indicates, where the entity is, that is to say, its status in the real world, the abstract essence omits the particularity of the status. The philosophy of organism in its appeal to the facts can thus support itself by an appeal to the insight of John Locke, who in British philosophy is the analogue to Plato, in the epic of his life, in personal endowments, in width of experience, and in dispassionate statement of conflicting intuitions. This doctrine of organism is the attempt to describe the world as a process of generation of individual actual entities, each with its own absolute self-attainment. This concrete finality of the individual is nothing else than a decision referent beyond itself. The perpetual perishing, d. Locke, 2, 14, 1 t, of individual absoluteness is thus foredoomed. But the perishing of absoluteness is the attainment of objective immortality. This last conception expresses the further element in the doctrine of organism that the process of generation is to be described in terms of actual entities. Chapter 2 The Extensive Continuum Section I 95 We must first consider the perceptive mode in which there is clear, distinct consciousness of the extensive relations of the world. These relations include the extensiveness of space and the extensiveness of time. Undoubtedly, this clarity, at least in regard to space, is obtained only in ordinary perception through the senses. This mode of perception is here termed presentational immediacy. In this mode, the contemporary world is consciously prehended as a continuum of extensive relations. 
It cannot be too clearly understood that some chief notions of European thought were framed under the influence of a misapprehension, only partially corrected by the scientific progress of the last century. This mistake consists in the confusion of mere potentiality with actuality. Continuity concerns what is potential, whereas actuality is incurably atomic. This misapprehension is promoted by the neglect of the principle that, so far as physicated relations are concerned, contemporary events happen in causal independence of each other. Point one this principle will have to be explained later, in connection with an examination of process and of time. It receives an exemplification in the character of our perception of the world of contemporary actual entities. That contemporary world is objectified 96 verses, real it is objectiva, illustrating bare extension with its various parts discriminated by differences of sense data. TV's qualities, such as colors, sounds, bodily feelings, tastes, smells, together with the perspectives introduced by extensive relationships, are the relational eternal objects whereby the contemporary actual entities or elements in our constitution. This is the type of objectification which, in sect, seven of the previous chapter has been termed, presentational objectification. In this way, by reason of the principle of contemporary independence, the contemporary world is objectified for us under the aspect of passive potentiality. The very sense data by which its parts are differentiated are supplied by antecedent states of our own bodies, and so is their distribution in contemporary space. Our direct perception of the contemporary world is thus reduced to extension, defining I our own geometrical perspectives, and E possibilities of mutual perspectives for other contemporary entities. One this principle lies on the surface of the fundamental Einsteinian formula for the physical continuum. 61. Discussions and Applications 62. Inter se, and E. Possibilities of division. These possibilities of division constitute the external world of continuum. For a continuum is divisible, so far as the contemporary world is divided by actual entities, it is not a continuum, but is atomic. Thus the contemporary world is perceived with its potentiality for extensive division, and not in its actual atomic division. The contemporary world is perceived by the senses as the datum for contemporary actuality, and is therefore continuous divisible but not divided. The contemporary world is in fact divided and atomic, being a multiplicity of definite actual entities. These contemporary actual entities are divided from each other, and are not themselves divisible into other contemporary actual entities. This antithesis will have to be discussed later d. Part 4, but it is necessary to adumbrate it here. This limitation of the way in which the contemporary actual entities are relevant to the formal, Existence of the subject in question is the first example of the general 97 principle, that objectification relegates into irrelevance, or into a subordinate relevance, the full constitution of the objectified entity. Some real component in the objectified entity assumes the role of being how that particular entity is a datum in the experience of the subject. In this case, the objectified contemporaries are only directly relevant to the subject in their character of arising from a datum which is an extensive continuum. They do, in fact, atomize this continuum, but the aboriginal potentiality, 
which they include and realize, is what they contribute as the relevant factor in their objectifications. They thus exhibit the community of contemporary actualities as a common world with mathematical relations where the term mathematical is used in the sense in which it would have been understood by Plato, Euclid, and Descartes before the modern discovery of the true definition of pure mathematics. The bare mathematical potentialities of the extensive continuum require an additional content in order to assume the role of real objects for the subject. This content is supplied by the eternal object ST term sensidata. These objects are given for the experience of the subject. Their givenness does not arise from the decision of the contemporary entities which are thus objectified. It arises from the functioning of the antecedent physical body of the subject, and this functioning can in its turn be analyzed as representing the influence of the more remote past, a past common alike to the subject and to its contemporary actual entities. Thus these sense data are eternal objects playing a complex relational role. They connect the actual entities of the past with the actual entities of the contemporary world, and thereby affect objectifications of the contemporary things and of the past things. For instance, we see the contemporary chair, but we see it with our eyes and we touch the contemporary chair, but we touch it with our hands. Thus colors objectify the chair in one way, and objectify the eyes in another way, as elements in the experience of the subject. 98 also touch objectifies the chair in one way, and oh, the extensive continuum. 63 objectifies the hands in another way, as elements in the experience of the subject. But the eyes and the hands are in the past, the almost immediate past, and the chair is in the present. The chair, thus objectified, is the objectification of a contemporary nexus of actual entities in its unity as one nexus. This nexus is illustrated as to its constitution by the spatial region, with its perspective relations. This region is, in fact, atomized by the members of the nexus. By the operation of the category of transmutation D. Parts 3 and IV in the objectification and abstraction is made from the multiplicity of members and from all components of their formal constitutions, except the occupation of this region. This prehension, in the particular example considered, will be termed the prehension of a chair image. Also the intervention of the past is not confined to antecedent eyes and hands. There is a more remote past throughout nature external to the body. The direct relevance of this remote past, relevant by reason of its direct objectification in the immediate subject, is practically negligible, so far as concerns prehensions of a strictly physical type. But external nature has an indirect relevance by the transmission through it of analogous prehensions. In this way there are in it various historical roots of intermediate objectifications. Such relevant historical roots lead up to various parts of the animal body, and transmit into it prehensions which form the physical influence of the external environment on the animal body. But this external environment which is in the past of the concrescent subject is also, with negligible exceptions, in the past of the nexus which is the objectified chair image. If there be a real chair, there will be another historical root of objectifications from nexus to nexus in this environment. The members of each nexus will be mutually contemporaries.
Also the historical route will lead up to the nexus which is the chair image. The complete nexus, composed of this historical route and the 99 chair image, will form a corpuscular society. This society is the real CA chair. The prehensions of the concrescent subject and the formal constitutions of the members of the contemporary nexus which is the chair image are thus conditioned by the properties of the same environment in the past. The animal body is so constructed that, with rough accuracy and in normal conditions, important emphasis is thus laid upon those regions in the contemporary world which are particularly relevant for the future existence of the enduring object of which the immediate percipient is one occasion. A reference to the category of transmutation will show that perception of contemporary images in the mode of presentational immediacy is in impure prehension. The subsidiary, pure, physical prehensions are the components which provide some definite information as to the physical world. The subsidiary, pure, mental prehensions are the components by reason of which the theory of secondary qualities was introduced into the 64. Discussions and Applications Theory of Perception The account here given traces back these secondary qualities to their root and physical prehensions expressed by the witness of the body. If the familiar correlations between physical paths and the life histories of a chair and of the animal body are not satisfied, we are apt to say that our perceptions are delusive. The word, delusive, is all very well as a technical term, but it must not be misconstrued to mean that what we have directly perceived, we have not directly perceived. Our direct perception, via our senses, of an immediate extensive shape, in a certain geometrical perspective to ourselves, and in certain general geometrical relations to the contemporary world, remains an ultimate fact. Our inferences are at fault. In Cartesian phraseology, it is a final, inspectio, also termed, intuitio, which, when purged of all, judicium, i.e., of, inference, is final for belief. This whole question of delusive perception must be considered later D. Part 3, CHS. 3 to V in more 100 detail. We can, however, see at once that there are grades of delusiveness. There is the non-delusive case, when we see a chair image and there is a chair. There is the partially delusive case when we have been looking in a mirror, in this case, the chair image we see is not the culmination of the corpuscular society of entities which we call the real chair. Finally, we may have been taking drugs, so that the chair image we see has no familiar counterpart in any historical root of a corpuscular society. Also there are other delusive grades where the lapse of time is the main element. These cases are illustrated by our perceptions of the heavenly bodies. In delusive cases we are apt, in a confusing way, to say that the societies of entities which we did not see but correctly inferred are the things that we, really, saw. The conclusion of this discussion is that the ingression of the eternal object's term, sense data into the experience of a subject cannot be construed as the simple objectification of the actual entity to which, in ordinary speech, we ascribe that sense datum as a quality. The ingression involves a complex relationship, whereby the sense datum emerges as the given, eternal object by which some past entities are objectified for X.
Ample, color seen with the eyes and bad temper inherited from the viscera, and whereby the sense datum also enters into the objectification of a society of actual entities in the contemporary world. RTH use a sense datum has ingression into experience by reason of its forming the what of a very complex multiple integration of prehensions within that occasion. For example, the ingression of a visual sense datum involves the causal objectification of various antecedent bodily organs and the presentational objectification of the shape seen, this shape being a nexus of contemporary actual entities. In this account of the ingression of sense data, the animal body is nothing more than the most intimately relevant part of the antecedent settled world. To sum up this account, when we perceive a contemporary extended shape which we term a chair, the sense 101 J data involved are not necessarily elements in the real internal constitution of this, the extensive continuum. 65 chair image. They are elements in some way of feeling in the real internal constitutions of those antecedent organs of the human body with which we perceive the chair. The direct recognition of such antecedent actual entities, with which we perceive contemporaries, is hindered and, apart from exceptional circumstances, rendered impossible by the spatial and temporal vagueness which infects such data. Later, CF. Part 3, CHs. Free to be the whole question of this perception of a nexus vaguely, that is to say, without distinction of the actual entities composing it, is discussed in terms of the theory of prehensions and in relation to the category of transmutation. Section 2. This account of presentational immediacy presupposes two metaphysical assumptions. I that the actual world, in so far as it is a community of entities which are settled, actual, and already become, conditions and limits the potentiality for creativeness beyond itself. This, given, world provides determinate data in the form of those objectifications of themselves which the characters of its actual entities can provide. This is a limitation laid upon the general potentiality provided by eternal objects, considered merely in respect to the generality of their natures. Thus, relatively to any actual entity, there is a given world of settled actual entities and a real potentiality which is the datum for creativeness beyond that standpoint this datum which is the primary phase in the process constituting an actual entity is nothing else than the actual world itself in its character of a possibility for the process of being felt this exemplifies the metaphysical principle that every being is a potential for a becoming. The actual world is the objective content of each new creation. Thus we have always to consider two meanings of 102 potentiality, a the general potentiality, which is the bundle of possibilities, mutually consistent or alternative, provided by the multiplicity of eternal objects, and be the real potentiality which is conditioned by the data provided by the actual world. General potentiality is absolute, and real potentiality is relative to some actual entity, taken as a standpoint whereby the actual world is defined. It must be remembered that the phrase, actual world is, like, yesterday, and, tomorrow, in that it alters its meaning according to standpoint. The actual world must always mean the community of all actual entities, 
including the primordial actual entity called God and the temporal actual entities. Curiously enough, even at this early stage of metaphysical discussion, the influence of the relative